years, you've started to see a number of people starting to talk about how this is changing us. Linda Stone, um, formerly of Apple and also formerly of Microsoft, coined the phrase uh, continuous partial attention and is kind of worried about the... Oh, I think that's terrific. It's a great phrase and I love it. Yeah, she's kind of worried about the effects that that's having. Uh, Nick Carr had a story on the cover of The Atlantic recently um, that was his lament about how he feels that his ability to focus and even to read long form material has been degraded by the sort of multiplexing of information sources, ah, and communication channels. Stogies. How can they, they're what, what cantankerous people. Don't they see what's going on before their eyes? Let's call it the triumph of ADD. <laughs> there was a study done. Um, it was published about six months ago. And in evolutionary medicine, there's been a hypothesis for about 15 years that maybe ADD was something that was adaptive to a different environment, like the famous hunter-gatherer environment in which the uh, evolutionary, the, the reigning dogmatists of evolutionary biology feel that all of humanity was formed, which isn't true because you can trace an awful lot of it back to bacteria. But still, um, it turns out that kids with ADD don't do that well in our society, but kids in a nomadic society with ADD come out on top. Hmm. Um, and I think we're getting back to ADD, and I love ADD. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. I think that continuous partial attention is fantastic. When I used to walk into my son's bedroom, and he would be hooked up to his earpiece on his cell phone, talking to his, or with his best friend. They weren't talking. They were keeping each other company all day. Um, and he'd be on uh, his Xbox, and, and by the way, Microsoft deserves a lot of credit for the Xbox. It's terrific. He'd be on his Xbox playing Halo with 16 other kids, and he didn't even wonder where they came from. Some of them were in Asia. Some of them were in Europe. They, they were all over the world. He was able to go through this astonishing social interaction and do his homework simultaneously and do it well. I thought it was terrific. Now, when I'm running... I run this. I was sort of kidnapped by the space community. Edgar Mitchell and uh, Buzz Aldrin, and uh, the the um, program director for computational intelligence of the National Science Foundation, was one of the kidnappers. Um, the um, uh, head of uh, the chief research scientist in NASA Langley's research division, uh, a whole bunch. I mean, the head of the future technology and science branch of the Air Force. These guys got me <laughs> to form a group. Um, called the Space Development Steering Committee, in which we're trying to steer humanity into the realm of its next set of dreams. And um, when I'm on meetings during the week, I have these amazing geniuses on the phone with me. We're doing a teleconference call. It's every Thursday night at 9 o'clock. These guys are fantastic. But I am so restless, it's ridiculous. And I've discovered that if I take another Microsoft device, if I take my um, wireless uh, keyboard, and I edit pictures that I've taken with my Sony uh, camera that's the size of a credit card. While I am doing the meeting, I can concentrate more on the meeting. Well, you know, people have always taken their knitting into meetings. That's kind of the equivalent. Right. They're t they've taken their knitting. They've taken their worry beads. Because um, when you have, try to restrain all the rest of the human body and the interests of the tiny segment of the brain and the neocortex, that's the self, the conscious self, the rest of the body rebels. Well, that's, that, that is energy that can be put to use. Why restrict the body to one flow of information when it demands 20 flows of information simultaneously? When you're walking, you don't say, oh, my God, my walking is, is taking up part of my body's attention, and that's multiple um, the partial attention. I suppose, on the other hand, when you were writing The Lucifer Principle and The Global Brain, I'm sure there were long periods of sustained concentration and focused and attention. There are, but you know the little things that we writers go through. Isolation is painful. It is really difficult. Yeah, it is. And um, being faced with, when you're talking to your audience and you see them in front of you, you come alive. It's because of the inner judges. 
that work on the basis of input, feedback from other human beings, just the way that cells stay alive on the basis of input and feedback from other human beings. Mm -hmm. When you're writing, you have no feedback from other human beings. Well, that used to be true. Now, in the era of instant personal publishing and near instantaneous feedback and evaluation, you have an incredibly tight feedback loop, right? Well, you have it, but I'm not using it because when I, I mean, I am using it. But when I'm writing a book, it's a whole different thing. Right yeah. now I'm engaged in updating the, my first book, The Lucifer Principle, and making it much, much more clear. Now, I was thinking of you as I was doing my research today, because I can do things with Google I could not do 10 years ago or 20 years ago yep. when I was originally writing this book. And I'm astonished by how much I got done without a Google. Mm-hmm. But now I can do in, in five minutes what used to take me three days. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that just does that cheapen my writing? No, it increases my scope. Sure, it means I have to spend less time on the the um, culinary chores, the the scholarly chores of writing, and can spend more time on the aggregation of information and the thinking it through and the showing the principles that connect it. Absolutely. So, and I do that while I'm sitting at a tea lounge. I, you know, I work in this club called the Tea Lounge. It's everything the Starbucks ever wanted to be and never was. It's, it's sort of equivalent to what you see on Friends. It's big couches and easy chairs, and I'm watching all kinds of beautiful girls go past all the time. And when I'm really concentrating, I have friends there. They try to interrupt me. They become used to the fact that I'm the rudest person on the planet for up to three to four hours straight, because it does take concentration to put together the kind of information we're talking about, to write books that are encyclopedic and still have zip and style and still give you a sense of insight. So what do you think might be happening on the social net in well, this terms is the of tricky the tricky thing, you know, uh, this, if this... we one of the, the the images with which uh Douglas Hofstetter um arrested a lot of us back in the days of Good Lesher Bach is the fact that if you look at a uh an ant colony from a distance, you see that it takes on a shape of its own and is a, is an organism, a superorganism. Uh he got that from uh William Morton Wheeler who observed the same thing around 1911. Um, But it's a very important concept. Something emerges from the, well, look, you're you're 100 trillion cells and I'm 100 trillion cells. Between 50 and, depending on who's counting, let's just say 50 trillion of those cells don't even claim to be you or me. They're bacterial colonies. They're on our skin turning what we exude into pheromones. They're in our uh, gut digesting our food for us. A lot of the stuff we eat, we're walking munching machines. We find the stuff, we chew the stuff, we send it down to them. And they digest it for us, if we can't digest it. They make our vitamins B's and K's. If you were down on their level, the level of the the individual cells, say your heart cells, your liver cells, or the bacterial cells, you would be totally incapable of seeing that you were part of a big body. And what shape that big body takes, and the fact that it gives itself a name, John, and introduces itself to other human beings. If somebody suggested it to you, and you were down on the cellular level, and you'd been there all your life, you were going to live there and die there. If somebody suggested that there was this emergent whole that was even more vivid than you are, and that it comes from your individual actions, you would say to that other cell, you're nuts. This can't possibly be. So the big question is, what emergent shape equivalent to the identity of you and me may be coming from these new forms of interaction between us? Well, where I was going with that is to sort of follow with your notion that you have not only individuals, but subgroups, which are in effect testing different strategies and hypotheses. One of the fundamental principles at work right now is that as Clay Shirky has kind of hammered home group formation and group activity have just gotten trivially easy. The activation threshold for forming groups and participating in group behavior has dropped nearly to zero. And so uh, you could speculate that what that's going to mean is that there's going to be this, you know, rich diversity of what you've called uh, intergroup tournaments happening and some sort of hyper acceleration of you know, the group selection and the evolutionary effects of that. And, you know, I mean, a a hopeful way to look at that would be it's going to, as a species, make us a lot smarter, which God knows we 
better get a lot smarter pretty yeah, quick because we're really right digging ourselves. We're on the brink of World War III, and I'm not kidding. I mean, we are seriously digging ourselves into just multiple holes, and I'd like to think that that's a way out, but uh, it's hard to to see evidence of that yet. I mean, it's a nice 